Maybe we get started. Uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to another Terasaki talk series. Today we have Professor David Kaplan from Tufts University. He is the Stern Family and Duff Professor of Engineering at Tufts University, a distinguished university professor and professor and chair of the Department of Biomedical Engineering. His research focuses on biopolymer engineering to understand structure function relationships for biomaterials, tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. He has published more than 900 peer reviewed papers and serves on many editorial boards and programs for journals and universities. He is editor in chief of ACS Biometrial Science and Engineering and has received numerous awards for his research and teaching. He was elected fellow of the American Institute for American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering and National Academy of Engineering. David, the floor is yours. Great, uh, thanks so much, Murat. Um, first of all, greetings from uh, Boston, where we had snow the other day, just if you're not here. And uh, thanks very much to the Institute for the opportunity to talk to you today about some of our research on tissue engineering uh, human brains. So uh, what I've done is, organize the talk in a, a couple of phases. For the first part, I'm just gonna give you some motivation and really some of the tools we've been developing over the last few years and why at least we think they're important. Uh, then in the middle part, I'm gonna give you two examples uh, really focused on brain related uh, either diseases or uh, disruptions. And then the very end of the talk, I'm gonna talk about two what I would call much more controversial issues in terms of what I think we could do with these brain tissues and, and hopefully elicit some, uh, some comments from the, the audience that's listening. And thanks very much to everyone uh, listening and taking an hour of your time today. So, uh, so that's my goal. Uh, let's see if we can get this to move. Hang on a second. We're frozen. I don't know if that's me or you. Great. Oh, here we go, good. Um, okay, so just a very little background because I think most of the audience I expect to be pretty savvy about these topics, but uh, you know, if you wanna understand computational issues, no better place than to look than the brain, whether you care about what you eat and how you think, another great place, just regenerative medicine. Those of us who are aging, we'd like to figure out how to reverse the process and, and quickly if we could. Uh, lots of neurodegenerative disease needs, I'll talk about two of those as we go through the talk. Uh, those of you who know the field of mental health, you know there is no such thing as a effective drug today. It's really trial and error, mostly failure, and a pretty sad state of affairs. Uh, with the current pandemic, I'm sure you, many of you know that there is impact of COVID on the human brain. Exactly what that's going to be long-term, no one knows, but we'd like to get ahead of that. Uh, and then everything from TBI, to how do we learn, how do we memorize thought? These are all things I think we can eventually get to by the studies uh, that we and others are, are working on, obviously. Um, so this, I, I show a dead tree because it shows you how bad the situation is. If nothing else, it hopefully excites, if there's any students in the audience to get excited about this field of human brain tissue engineering. And if not, uh, I have failed miserably in my hour with you, but we'll give it a try. Uh, so uh, whatever your favorite mode of study, whether it's animals to chips to organoids, as you see on the, the dead limbs, they have all failed us so far, not for lack of trying. And the needs are all at the bottom there. And you can pick your, your favorite need, whether it's TBI or Parkinson's or you know brain tumors, the glioblastomas, uh, just discovering drugs, depression, anxiety, the list is extensive and there's really very poor options for patients today. So at least in our group, we thought we could try and make a contribution here. And that was the original goal a number of years ago. And so this is sort of our mantra in our own group in terms of what guides our choices for tissue engineering, whatever tissue it might be here for the brain, uh, you know, the keys are the following. One is it has to be human relevant, right? So if we're gonna solve problems for human physiology, we need to work with tissue engineered systems that reflect the human physiology. Uh, number two, and this is really pertinent for neurodegenerative diseases, you want systems that are, uh, I call them sustainable, that, that, that function for both acute, but also long-term uh, 
long-term effects. So to be able to study both acute and chronic effects, whether it's drugs or diseases, you know, that really is paramount here for uh, brain-related studies. And then the last bit is kind of the same as real estate shopping, right? It's all about location, location, location. So here it's compartmentalization. We wanted to build systems where we knew where the cells were, where we could interrogate the cells and so on. So that's been sort of the guiding principles for what we've been trying to do with tissue engineering, the, the human brain. And again, I, I don't know everyone in the audience, obviously. So here are the, the, the repertoire of tools that are out there, all of which uh, provide value added to the field um, and, and each of which has a particular place. Uh, we've looked at this landscape and you know, published this recent review on, on the landscape. What we tend to focus on now in the group are the two sort of red circled items. One, uh, the culture platforms we like to use are the porous scaffolds for the reasons back here, sustainable long-term compartmentalization, compartmentalization and control. And then also we, we look at a lot of different cell types in our models, but in the most of what I'll talk about today are you know, iPSC derived uh, brain cells for the work. Um, we do work on some of the others as well, but these have become the most, I'd say advantageous for the, the goals for our particular studies. So this is the old slide I used. This is when we first developed the model. We call it affectionately uh, the donut model. And you can see the cartoon uh, in, the, in the bottom middle here. And it is just like a donut, right? The outer ring is the gray matter-like substance. And this is made of our silk protein spongy scaffold where we house the cells that are gonna make up the, the cortical-like brain system. And in the middle, we call it the donut hole. That's what we would call the white matter. That's where all the axons, all the synapses, all the action is in terms of the brain uh, structure function. So that's the system we started. You can obviously build in multiple rings if you want, which you see here to create other layers and so on. We have found we can do most of what we want with just these uh, two layers here in, in, in this case. And I'll go through some of the things we've been doing with this. So, so the heart of the matter is the, the biomaterial scaffold. Why do I call it so important? Because you've got to modulate with the right mechanics, the right morphology, the right chemistry, the right structures, you know, the list goes on and on. Those of you in the, the biomaterials field, you know all this already, but you've got to create a niche where the neurons are going to be completely comfortable, start talking to each other, and our sort of uh, readout to know that's working or not is whether we get axons growing into the center gel, which we can image then, and forming synapses, you know, having calcium signaling, looking at electrical signals, all these things. So there's a biological structural readout that's evident if it's working well or if it's not. Uh, again, just for time, you know, there's a lot of factors that go into these designs, whether it's the coating that we use on the silk protein, the porosity, the stiffness, et cetera, that's all important that allows us to run these systems for long periods of time. Uh, and then the center gel can be interchangeable. It can be collagen, HA, or ECM gels. I'll talk about some of those as we go through, um, through the talk. And the very earliest paper we published showed the following. This is what one of those donuts looks like, right? About two millimeter donut hole where all the synapses are. They're, they're around the, the sponge as well, but you can image them easier in, in the clear gel, the, the collagen gel in the initial design. Uh, these run anywhere from 12 down to eight millimeters. Sometimes we'll do a gel that's only two millimeters thick, sometimes uh, one millimeter thick, depends on the particular study. This is what the axons start to look like in the center gel. We'll show you more of that. And in the spongy areas, the donut ring, you see lots of activity for the cells as well. So very good uh, activity. A lot of the staining we do is, is beta-3 tubulin, obviously for the neurons. Uh, we'll show you some of the other staining as we go, uh, go along. You know, the early design, we weren't sure what kind of composite materials we wanted to use. So if you just used a porous sponge-like scaffold alone, the cells do fine. And you can see that here at the top left and amplified on the top right. But the, the sort of axons and neuron uh, interaction synapses tended to be confined only to the pores in the sponges and really only al along the perimeter of those pores. 
Uh, and those of you who work with collagen, you know you get this kind of outcome if all you use is a collagen gel or sponge, you get cells that just don't behave well, don't spread out dendrites and, and really do what you wanna do. Once we went to the composite system that you see here, you get really good cell growth, axon uh, propagation and synapses by using this uh, composite system. And once we established that, we started with primary uh, mouse cells to get this going. Then we switched over the initial work uh, with one of the postdocs was using human induced, induced neural stem cells. These were fibroblast derived. And you can see again, here's the, the donut. And here are the axons generated in the center window after time. You can see a really nice axon density. We had really good calcium signaling uh, there as well to know we were starting to get uh, what I would call a functional brain unit that we could start to do some experiments with. And so that led to a lot of different studies. I'm just gonna highlight a few things that I think are at least interesting. Um, so one was uh, you know, to take this center material here, you know, our sort of white matter again, and add to that other components that we thought might play a role in uh, nerve cell outcomes. And so the initial work was simply to take porcine brains and take fairly young and fairly old porcine brains, extract the ECM and add that into our center uh, materials to create now uh, sponges that had this different kind of uh, ECM mediated cell effect uh, in the outcome. And so the, the devices were made with the ECM in there after gelation, then you could grow the cells up again and now look at what the effect was on, on those neurons. And you can see the effect here. Uh, if you looked at fetal brain in the matrix, now you see this incredibly more dense axon network, which was even more amplified than we saw in the adult brain, the middle, and further more amplified than the original collagen type one matrix that we used. That was quantified as well, but it gave us a hint, as you might expect, that the, the ECM that you use in these brain tissue models is really critical in terms of the outcomes that you get in terms of axon density and overall cell-related uh, effects. And that was amplified a couple of years later with one of the studies where we were uh, looking at brain tumors. Uh, and these were both, we looked at epidemiomas as well as glioblastomas in terms of primary patient isolates and how they behaved in these 3D tissue models. I just put one, uh, two slides in, I guess, today for this. So here's the model again, Brightfield. Here are the images that you get from those uh, systems. And let's just talk about the glioblastomas at the bottom. And here we're using the fetal derived ECM in collagen. Here it's the adult derived ECM in collagen. Here's the pure collagen alone. And if you look at the glio outcomes growing over three weeks in these um, sort of donut models, you see really nice sort of clusters of cells starting to grow representing the tumors. And interesting to us, these tumors never migrated under these conditions out of that outer ring into the center well, which was very different than you see with a different kind of tumor here where they all migrated into the center well. So you can actually start to look at tumor cell migration in these models, depending on the, the nature of the cell source and the nature of the ECM you use. And you can also see here, depending on fetal, adult, or pure collagen, the outcome in terms of tumor growth was quite different as well whereas you saw more robust sort of clusters than you did uh, uh, comparing the fetal uh, was less than the adult or the pure collagen. So this gives you systems to start to manipulate tumor growth in a very controlled way and start to ask questions about how to moderate that growth, how to treat the growth and so on, all things we've done and reported and, and things we're continuing to study. But I think one of the important things that comes out of this is, is really how important the matrix is that you use in these models in terms of the questions you might be asking. And just one example from the published work is here where we did RNA-seq and we compared essentially the heat maps and uh, principal component analysis based on these matrices that we used. And the long story short shows you that the adult and fetal ECM versions allowed clustering of the sequence data 
very different than just the pure collagen alone. So the, the critical nature of the ECM here uh, tells you a lot about which uh, genes may be upregulated. And that's really important, obviously, in terms of the questions you might be asking with these kinds of brain tissue models, or for that matter, any tissue model, as again, many of you, I'm sure, are aware. All right, so that led us down to a number of other studies. Uh, this one is more, I would call, a mechanics study. And the postdoc here was interested in the question of vibration, right? So if you're maybe a chronic runner on the left, right, or an astronaut, or just a fighter pilot, you're exposed to constant vibrations in terms of your, your human brain. And the question Nick wanted to ask in his studies was, does vibration affect the nature of these sort of donut models that we're studying and, and how we might look at that. So what he found in these models, so if you look at it, the, the cartoon is at the bottom here. So pre-exposure, we see the same way we've talked about. And over time with post-exposure, and we used essentially a, a reciprocating plate, a rotational uh, cell culture plate here. Um, and post-exposure, the question is, do the cells stay in the donut ring? or did they migrate to the center and did things change? And the take home messages I'll tell you at the beginning, I'll show you a bit of data is the answer is yes, cells with this vibration migrated depending on the, the frequency and so on of the, the vibrations that we use, but they did tend to migrate to the center. Uh, that was in part due to the deformations that we saw in the ECM in the, the, the tissue models that we're using. And this provides a really good starting point for exploring mechanisms and treatments going forward. And the real question we wanna ask in the long term is, does this kind of perturbation just from subtle migrations impact the brain tissue so that you get links to long-term neurodegenerative diseases? And because the models that we developed can be run for long periods of time, it gives us a really nice sort of segue into those kinds of studies uh, going forward. So what does some of this look like? It looks like the following, and a lot of data here, I'll just highlight a few things, happy to answer any questions. But if you look at the applied angular velocity as we try and deform the donut models, and we just look at cell counts as the cells do or don't migrate to the center uh, donut hole, the gel, if you will, you see there's a sweet spot where you get a lot more cell migration than if you're at the control, no, no perturbation or very high levels. And you can see images of this. Here is 200 RPMs, uh, and you see cells in that center donut here and here, whereas the controls, you see no cells, as you would expect, in that center donut. Um, and that you can look up close and personal and see the clustering of those cells. And you see also, aside from the neurons, some, some astrocyte migration as well to those center clusters as we carry out these uh, experiments, and this is a five-day experiment that was run uh, by the postdoc. So the question is, are the cells moving or are the cells moving in response to a change in the matrix? And that's what you see here. Here's just matrix affected by the shaking or the vibrations. And you see no, no modifications here. The collagen looks fairly homogeneous in that center window. And as you start to increase that degree of reciprocation. Now we get up to 200 RPMs or so, and you start to see islands or defects in the collagen or clustering, or we call it hyperdensities, where you see the yellow arrows here, right? So, so that again, there's this region of perturbation of the system where you start to see uh, collagen islands forming just due to this uh, reciprocating uh, shaking regime applied to the donut models. So um, Nick carried out, a, I think, a very clever experiment at the end to, to see whether this is important or not. And so he created a 2D layer of collagen, either high density or low density, depending on the system. And he deposited higher low density collagen droplets or islands on top of that collagen layer, reflecting those clusters of collagen I just showed you on the last slide. And then he deposited his cells on the surface and simply let the cells migrate and see what they did. And really what he's looking here at the interface is how do those cells respond to these sort of concentration dependent defects in the collagen that we saw during shaking. And the answer was pretty stark. So 
at the sort of control or low concentration collagen, so the same as the underlying collagen layer, no cell clustering, just your normal growth of the neurons. Whereas at the high concentration islands, you saw very clear cell clustering, also at the boundaries where the, the high and low concentrations were. So this suggested that the cells are actually responding to these collagen defects in the uh, donut tissues for the brain as an indication of where we wanna look for long-term effects and uh, how to control those kinds of defects. You know, the, the last bit he studied was he took an isolated or, or explanted uh, neonatal, rat, neonatal rat brains and asked the same question. So we exposed those to shaking as well uh, in the dishes. And we looked at the cortical layer and our deeper layer, the hippocampal layer to look at defects. And you can see here, if there's no shaking, there's really no deformation or no change. Low levels, not much effect. But once you got up to this kind of higher level of shaking, you started to see tears and defects in the collagen layers. I'm sorry, in the, the native uh, uh, brain tissue layers in the cortical regions. And you did not see those in the, in the deeper layers. So the cortical regions were more susceptible to these defects. So what does it all mean? We don't know, but we certainly know the model can reflect some of these worries about uh, chronic vibrational exposures. And the goal now is to look at long-term impact on neurodegenerative disease states through these kinds of defects, cell migration, cell clustering, and what do you see longer term? So that's one place we see the model having a lot of value in terms of uh, some of these sort of more chronic disease states that we might want to study. Another example, another postdoc, Olga here has been looking at uh, multiple cell types. So aside from neurons and astrocytes, where we look at microglia as part of the complex 3D system, just for time, this is what they look like. They're all there, they're all functioning. And once we know we can track them, again, remember compartmentalization, controlling what cells are where, we now have a system we can look at for uh, you know, very different kinds of questions. And so just one slide on, on Olga's work, and this is a, a collaboration I want to make sure I mention with Michael Whalen at Mass General. Uh, we look at what he studied in vivo with uh, mouse and rat studies and what we do in vitro with our 3D model and ask questions about TBI related damage. Here we're using something called a controlled cortical impact. So you grow the tissue model and then you drop a weight on it basically is the idea, but under very controlled conditions. And when we, the questions we ask here are what genes are upregulated, what sort of pathways are activated. And we're mostly interested in things like necroptosis and obviously other inflammatory related uh, sort of downstream effects from this. And then can we intervene in these pathways? So we ameliorate some of the effects of TBI related damage. And again, apologies, but just for time, I'll just say we can start to mimic what we see in vivo from Mike's lab with what we see in vitro with Mike as well. And we could see very similar outcomes in terms of uh, both gene upregulation and you know, protein responses as a result of this in some of these programmed cell death pathways, indicating the model's a reasonable starting point to predict what you're gonna see in vivo, but you can do this with much more controlled conditions in vitro. So that's encouraging. And the more recent work where, again, we haven't published this yet, but we're getting ready to, where we look at a number of drugs that could interfere with some of these uh, you know, programmed cell death pathways. And clearly some of them you see here where we're almost back to where the sham is. Meaning if we provide the right inhibition of downstream effects, we actually seem to recover or prevent damage to the cells in sort of these propagating effects uh, related to neurodegeneration. We have a lot more to do, but these are encouraging signs going forward with the tissue models we're talking about and how we might be able to use these. All right, so I'm gonna shift over uh, the other uh, big item I wanna talk about before I get to the controversial issues at the end would be uh, neurodegenerative diseases themselves. And I, I don't think I need to preach to this audience about um, the needs here. These are epidemics out there, whether you're talking about dementia, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, uh, you know, whether we want to talk about mental health in general, these are, these are severe problems. I, I use an old slide here just to point out Alzheimer's remains a huge problem. Uh, really no good treatments today, you all know that. And despite progress in all these other disease 
diseases that are chronic out there, Alzheimer's is really lag behind uh, everything else. So we need solutions and we're hoping our model can start to hit to help these kinds of needs going forward. And so we started very simple. So uh, one of the PhD students worked on, an in, worked on the donut model and here he used uh, uh, human induced pluripotent stem cells from both normal and Alzheimer's patients. And again, the seeding we've talked about, the model is set up. And in this case, uh, he ran the models for up to eight months of continuous in vitro cultivation to look at how the cells responded in the two columns here. And you know, if I didn't tell you this, you would assume that these cultures are looking as good as they did at one week, meaning the, the, the system we set up is really good for chronic cultures long-term to so support these kind of uh, neurological diseases. You could see the different cell types, the neurons, the astrocytes, and so on, all working together in these, in these donut models over time. And we could expose them to different drugs to look at effects on electrophysiology, and they did respond meaning the nerves are active and, and doing the kinds of things you'd expect in vitro. So that led to Nick doing a long-term study on Alzheimer's. Again, I, uh, iPSCs here, and these are all sporadic uh, Alzheimer's sources. So non-familiar AD uh, was not used here, just the sporadic version. And the outcomes from these, and I should start at the top. So here we make our donut model. We've talked about it here. The cells are seeded again. And then over time, we allow uh, the, the, the process to occur. And then we track what happens over time. And the unusual part of this study was this was a two, greater than two year study where we looked at cell responses over this time, markers of stress. And uh, with the disease samples, we were able to actually track Alzheimer's uh, phenotype over time. We had a subset of these Alzheimer's derived sporadic sources where we saw uh, both the amyloid and tau markers, I'll show you that in a minute, and also some issues of oxidative stress, which was really encouraging. <laughs> the downside, it took about a year in culture before you started to see uh, these phenotypes emerge. So good and bad results, but nonetheless really encouraging. This is, this is a culture, keep in mind, this is one example, this is almost 900 days of continuous in vitro culture to give you a sense of how robust these tissue models are. And you can see here's that donut window. Uh, so that's the center window. And here are the uh, nerves growing over time over this you know, almost three years. Uh, and you see mostly green. So the cells are doing fine. Uh, we can see really good robust responses over time and suggest these are really nice systems to use for long-term neurodegenerative studies. Here's what each cell type stained with. You know, here's 2G1, GFAP, and so on, merged images. But if you just look at the numbers, you see pretty sustained neuron density over time. You see a creeping up of the glial structures, as you might expect. But even after, uh, you know, over 800 days, we still have a, a reasonably moderate level. It doesn't take over the culture yet, suggesting these are pretty good out to a couple of years of continuous growth. And so some of the data Nick reported is here. If we look at all the cells and so on, you can look at sort of the, you know, A beta plaques 42-40 ratios, the, the overall Alzheimer's versus controls here you can see, but really what was interesting is we had this sort of clustering of some sort of sporadic like phenotypes with a subset of those cells that really were outliers in a good way, giving us a really uh, much stronger ratio of these um, of this phenotype than you would see with the rest of the cells. And you could see the same thing with tau, the tau ratios here, we had the same clustering as well. And you saw differences in sort of the, uh, the uh, reactive oxygen and nitrogen species at the same time. So again, this was the good outcome, right? We saw markers that would reflect well as reporters of the Alzheimer's disease. Uh, the downside, as I mentioned already, is you really need to get out to almost a year if you look at the x-axis before those features started to emerge in these particular studies. And the last bit here is if we looked at those outliers and compared those, so that's this group here with uh, LFP, so uh, local field potential elect electronic recordings, you saw the controls and the Alzheimer uh, uh, examples here, and you saw a significant dissipation on the number of spiking, uh, you know, self-induced spikes that you would see in these systems over time. Again, indications that uh, the, the models are providing a suitable 
microenvironment for the cells to create a disease phenotype that might be interesting. All right, so that was nice, but again, no one wants to wait, at least graduate students want to, don't want to wait a full year before they can get readouts and see how to do treatments and so on for these diseases. So uh, one of my most clever postdocs, uh, Dana, decided to uh, develop an infection model to try and accelerate uh, the readouts of these phenotypes for Alzheimer's disease. So uh, what she did is she took uh, herpes simplex virus. We, we used HSV1 for these studies because there are papers out there that suggested viral infections can give rise to uh, this Alzheimer's disease phenotype. So she felt it was a good model to use. So the, the approach is simply to take the same donut model. We've talked about that in uh, grow it up for four weeks. So you get a mature model that you could start to use. And at the same time, after, uh, after that start, the start of those um, growth of those cultures for maturation, she infected with uh, HSV1 to then ask the questions, was the virus in there? And how did it affect uh, the, the phenotypic outcomes that we were looking for. And you can see the statings here. Here's the MOX, a no viral infection. You don't see any detection of HSV. You don't see A beta plex. Uh, and you still see the cells are there, very good standing by DAPI. And if we've infected with virus, you get plenty of viral staining. You see amazing plaques formed in a very short period of time. And you see you can see the, the, the combination uh, merged image here. And if you want to look closely by SEM, you can even see some plaque forming units, uh, you know, if you squint well in, at the images as well. So in a very short period of time, these were only, I think, less than 14 day cultures. These were, I think, one week, we started to see uh, the phenotype appear. And here's some data from the paper from the published work. Uh, you know, you can look at sort of traditional markers, some of the amyloid proteins, Beta secretase, you know, not everything matched up perfectly. In fact, some did in a, in a very interesting way. Uh, glial markers were upregulated. You can look at inflammation. Here's TNF alpha with the virus. We had a huge uptick in inflammatory readouts as well as the sort of um, uh, you know gliosis-related markers here on the on the left side of this chart. And then also we saw the uh, readouts in terms of uh, local field potential, again, significant down regulation due to the presence of the virus versus the mock. So, so the outcome from this kind of study was pretty stark, right? It was unexpected that you know, these responses were seen in one week versus one year plus without the viral infections. And I would say the other real value here is how important pre-exposure to virus is in perhaps understanding downstream effects related to neurodegeneration. Again, tip of the iceberg here, obviously we'd like to infect with lots of different viruses, uh, different viral doses, and then look at all this. And this is part of the ongoing work that Dana is doing. Uh, and then obviously you could start to look at drug effects and so on, and you could extend this into COVID and other long-term effects on uh, using the donut model to study these kind of chronic uh, outcomes. You know, one of the goals of the group is to build a drug screening platform based on this. And, you know, if you follow what I said, if you can use optical tools to track the Alzheimer's outcomes, the phenotypes, and you could do that, then you have a rapid screen for various treatments. Again, these are ongoing efforts. You can develop this as an optical rapid screen as well. We have all human cells and systems here, and we have the versatility that I talked about before about ECM components, if you want to look at you know, young versus old, different uh, matrices and so on. So this is where the work is going uh, as we proceed uh, into the future. And we're pretty excited about this because the, the needs are huge, as you know, in the Alzheimer's fields for, for improved screens. All right, so I wanna close with two just very short stories uh, and then I'll finish up. Uh, the short stories I think will be more, uh, I'll call it more controversial. And it'll be controversial in terms of the science, I mean, kind of where this goes and what someone might want to do with it may be more controversial. So the first story, I just have a slide or two on each of these. So the first story is, can we get in vitro brain tissues to actually be trained, right? And meaning, can we eventually get cognition and control behavior in a dish? And, you know, we're not the first ones to look at this. Uh, you know, the postdoc Nick who did this work 
uh, is a big believer in this and he's convinced me to be a believer in this. Um, although I'm not sure I fully understand what the implications are here. But the idea is, you know, pick your favorite model and there's papers out there, 2D nerves in a dish. For us, obviously it's the donut model. And the question is, if you take the biological signals that we know how to read out, right? And we've talked about some of those already uh, in our time the, this morning, this afternoon, depending on where you are, um, can you turn that into some kind of reporter readout so you can actually determine whether the, the brain tissue is learning anything or not? And there are lots of sort of reporters you can consider here, but ultimately we focused on the, the sort of the electronics to see uh, what these systems can do. And we've just published a couple of papers on this if, if you want to read more about what the implications are. And so the way uh, Nick did this is, you know, a lot of data here, I'll just summarize it. So the idea is very simple. We grow our 3D model. And then what we do is we uh, essentially apply current to the model and then look at what we call invoke potential. So how do the nerves respond in terms of their electronic spikes as we treat them with these um, these input signals, if you will. And the idea in, in gross terms is if you can stimulate multiple times these tissues, you can look at the evoked potential and does that evoked potential, you can see sort of the amplitude here, does that dissipate or change over time? And that's termed habituation and some would argue that's the first step towards learning. So that's what we did, you can see the learning or some might call it the torture process we used here, right? So one is just the, the baseline spontaneous spiking we see in these models. And then we go through a training regime, a rest regime, training, rest, then sort of a toxic treatment to kill everything, which happens, and then the return to training and so on. So that's kind of the, the learning regime we used. And we did this with all kinds of amplitudes and frequencies to see where the sweet spots were. And you can sort of see the, the biggest outcomes here. If you look at um, sort of the, um, the change in evoked potential magnitude over time, it goes down with stimulation numbers or cycles. And you can see that the, the difference between the first and sort of downstream stimulation cycles goes up, meaning habituation is happening, meaning this kind of regime is happening. So that's pretty exciting, at least at this level of quote unquote learning, we're seeing a response in our models. Again, what it means, don't know, but it's, it's a place we can start and, and begin the process. And we, we decided to start to look at sort of gene regulation from those kinds of processes. So mass patterns, so just keep spiking and see what the, G, what the gene regulations are in these systems versus this distributed pattern, which is more like this learning paradigm I, sh I showed you here. And we simply ask the questions, what genes are upregulated or not? And you do see differences, right? And you see differences in, related to what, was, what people term in the literature as synaptic plasticity. And a lot of these are early genes. Um, and you can see some of these listed here. So, you know, we could speculate at this point, I don't wanna to do too much about some of these being related to memory and responses uh, related to conditioning, we don't know yet, but these are things we've started to sort of map with our early work and we have a lot more to do and look forward to doing more. All right, so that's one area of controversy, right? How far do you push this kind of concept and can you really evoke learning in a dish? And what does that mean going forward in terms of potential interfaces with robotics and even brain sort of transplants and so on. If you can infect a, a tissue in a dish and have it learn something and then use that in, in a device going forward or even a human being. And that leads to the last bit of controversy, which is on this slide, just one slide to summarize. And this is again, work we're doing in, in collaboration with UPenn, Isaac Chen's group. Uh, we have published the early work, which is uh, we, we prepared our donut models. We've talked about those. We've implanted in rodents to see if the cells and implants survive. So these would be, uh, could you use brain tissue implants to deal with severe brain injuries? And the answer is if we use a anti-inflammatory drug during those implants, the answer is yes, we get much better control of living outcomes. These are GFP labeled cells to do this than in the absence of those uh, anti-inflammatory treatments. So that's a good sign, but not great survival at three days. And now in the most recent work, which is being written up, uh, we see we can go out to a month 
and you get tremendous survival. You see all the green there in the implant zone in the animal, and you see lots and lots of GFP uh, related neurons growing, not only in the space we've implanted in the sponge, but moving out into the native tissue at the same time. So this is very encouraging. It suggests we're starting to evolve towards brain implants for long-term benefit. And then the question or controversy will be, should this be even a direction to pursue? Rodents may be fine, but how far do you take this, this approach in the future? So that's, again, uh, topics for discussion. So um, that's what I wanted to cover today in our limited time together. Uh, just to close out, I want to uh, remind you where we started, which is you know, lots of really cool systems out there. I'm sure some of you work with these, whether they're you know, post-mortem uh, brain tissues or brain slices are popular, you know, all kinds of cell sources, including uh, you know, using organoids, which we're also starting to work with in our models in collaboration with others. Um, I'm sure you have your favorite sort of approaches, whether they're hydrogels or uh, microfluidic chips, uh, 3D printing and so on. These are all, again, useful depending on the question you're asking and what kind of data you need. At least for us and what we talked about, we like our, our you know, porous scaffolds with uh, iPSCs for the most part. And hopefully I've convinced you if, if nothing else today that our systems are starting to have some human physiological relevance. They're certainly useful for chronic studies. I showed you data out to 2.3 years and we have control of what's where to allow us to do the kind of work we want to do. Um, you know, where do we sit with all this? I think, or I hope we're sort of at a, a useful interface in the field of, of studies of the brain because the needs, as we talked about, are just drastic. You know, we, we hope we're sort of at a place where we can amplify on what some of these other systems are useful for and add to that, particularly for these chronic studies, uh, the things we talked about a lot uh, in our time today. Uh, I want to end by thanking first my own group, my research group. This is a pre-COVID picture, so uh, you know we can't do this today, but at least in the past we could. Uh, so I'm thankful to, to all of them for their hard work. I'd like to thank, obviously, lots of funding agencies for their uh, amazing support, which we're grateful for. Uh, and you know, too many collaborators around the world to thank, but I, I did just want to highlight those on the the, the brain-related work here, you could see them all listed. I've mentioned a few of them today. I couldn't mention or cover everyone's work, but uh, to them, I'm, I'm in, uh, in, in incredibly thankful for your collegiality and, and collaborations and the work we're trying to do. Uh, with that, I wanna thank the audience for sticking around and I wanna thank the Institute for having me today and more than happy to answer questions if you have any. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you for this excellent seminar, uh, Professor Kaplan. Um, so a couple of questions came in. In HSV model for AD, the amyloid overlap with HSV. However, HSV is intracellular while plagiars are extracellular. How do you explain it? So again, this is, uh, you know, depends on lots of variables is a quick and simple answer and depends on the amount of virus you introduce, so the level of infection, and it de depends on the state of infection and the results of plaque or related depositions. So these are things we're still learning about in terms of the time dependent changes, uh, but it doesn't sort of really alter our feeling that the readouts seem to be reflective of the phenotypes that we want to see. So we have a lot more work to do. You know, the things I didn't get into are, you know, if you wait too long to study our treatments. There's no effective treatment. If you use your treatment early on, pre or during infection, you have a lot better effect as, way, as well. And that affects you know, the deposition of plaques, uh, the size of the plaques, where they are, and so on. So these are all things we're still learning about, and, and it's a great point. Can we conclude that the astrocyte resonant frequency is corresponding to that 270 RPM? It's a great, great point. Um, certainly coincides about there, a little bit lower as well. So that range seems to be the sweet spot for those particular studies. Now, keep in mind, that's a kind of a, a, a circular shaking system. So it'd be interesting to see if that holds up for other kinds of mechanical insult at the same frequency. I think that's a great point. Um, but yes, for the studies we've done so far. Great scaffold and mechanical vibration model. Is it possible to look 
at the oxygen gradient effect in moving cells and towards ECM? Huh, let's see. If I understand the question, you could certainly you know, put in electrodes or oxygen reporters to see where the gradients are. I would, I would hypothesize though, because we have not done that, or you could simply grow the models at different oxygen tensions to see how, you know, how the responses change. And I think that'd be fascinating to do. Uh, we have not done that. Um, I, I, I would hypothesize though, that you wouldn't see a severe oxygen gradient, except perhaps at the lower level where, where the, the donut is sitting on the solid substrate at the bottom of the culture dish, because there you might have some level, excuse me, of transport limitations, but I don't know that for a fact. But the fact you see very few dead cells over two plus years suggests that oxygen limitation is not a big issue, although there may be a gradient. And so things we haven't looked at very much, but I would love to look at those more. Thank you. Do you have any results with COVID-related infection on your donut model? Uh, can I answer it two ways? Yes and no. Uh, so we've, we've done a little bit of work with uh, infecting the model with COVID, but because of the facilities we have to use and the challenges with analysis, we don't have the data yet. Uh, we hope to get the data and then I'd have more to say because we are certainly pretty keen to see how COVID interfaces with the donut model and what it does or doesn't do uh, in terms of downstream effects. That's clearly one of our goals going forward. Would you please explain the challenges and differences in developing brain organoids in comparison to other tissues? Ooh, uh, great question as well. For those of you who work with any brain related cells, I think you would appreciate that they're just incredibly challenging to grow. They are, I call it fastidious. They don't like any, you know, you have to be careful. You have to feed them religiously. You have to take care of them every day and you just uh, have to make sure you don't get infections, obviously. So, so the answer is they're just, I think, you know, an order of magnitude more challenging than any other cell type that we've grown in our own group for lots of different, different tissue types. Um, I, th I think as well, one of the experiences we've had is even transporting our donut models between labs, like to go to MGH or other places in town to do analysis. You just have to be absolutely careful because just the, as we've talked about, the vibrations, the frequencies can have really a damaging effect on uh, some of the axons and some of the sort of finer features of these cells. So you know, everything has an effect. You have to really pay attention all the way through. Uh, but if you do it carefully, you could grow these things for long periods of time, like I've shown you. And, you know, it's, it's the great unknown, as you all know, right? The brain is sort of this black box still where we really need to learn a lot. And so the, the risk re rewards, I think, are there for the investment of time, energy, and money. Thank you. Have you considered to use these models for drug testing? Oh, sure. Yeah. And we've reported some of that in the papers. I just didn't cover it today for time. So if you want to look at our glioblastoma papers or you look at our other papers where we've, you know, used channel blockers, uh, that's all in there. And the models respond as you would predict or hypothesize based on known effects of these drugs. And really a lot of what we're doing right now is what I showed you on the HSV infection model that Dana is running where we're looking at a lot of different drugs uh, hypothesized to have an effect on uh, sort of, we'll just call it neurodegeneration, Alzheimer's related outcomes uh, in the model to see if they work or, or not. And in some cases we're seeing things that you would expect in other cases we're not. And that work has not been published yet, but it, it will be in the coming months. Thanks. Can you use a hybrid system of porous material and microfluidic device to include shear stress and media flow? Oh, it sounds great. Yes, please do, or talk to us. We're happy to collaborate. That would be wonderful. Thanks. Any impact by the absence of neurovascular unit and blood-brain barrier? Yeah, great questions again. You guys know your stuff, right? So of course, you, you know, you need a BBB in here to make it completely or more completely human, physiologically relevant. I, I just didn't talk about it today. We're about to send off a paper on our 
neurovascular unit, whether it's, you know, the holy grail or not, I don't know, but at least we have one that we've developed. And those of you who work on this, you know, the, the challenge really is the endothelial cells, the microvascular endothelial cells that are just very challenging to get your hands on, to grow, to form really ultra, you know, ultra tight junctions, and then interface it to the donut model that I've talked about. And we've done our best to do that. We have a model we're starting to get more comfortable with. We have a long way to go. And we'll then look at how that affects the readouts that I showed you today. I guess we have two answers overall. One is we get pretty good readouts already. So it's not the, the, the neurovascular unit isn't what I would call absolutely critical, but I think it certainly will modulate a lot of the effects, whether it's uh, inflammation, overall inflammation outcomes, uh, rates of disease formation, rates of repair and so on. These are all things we'll have to get to as we go forward. Thanks. In your donut model, at the beginning, you described you compared fetal versus adult porcine ECM, and that the fetal gave you increased number of neurons. Have you analyzed why that happens? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, so we did uh, the 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 PhD student who did the work uh, did a lot of work in terms of understanding through proteomics and other methods what was in the different compositions, and that's all in her thesis. Um, the good part is we saw some differences. The challenging part, as many of you know, is the ECM is not that easy to dissect out to figure out cause and effect. And so we have some leads from her thesis work. Uh, and one of the challenges, as you may know, is, is a lot of the ECM extraction work focuses more on the protein-based components, but in the brain, the, you know, some of the dominant components are gag-related. And so we had to take a lot of time, or she did, to, uh, go, to go to labs with expertise on gag-related omics, if you will. And so that took a lot of effort uh, to the point we couldn't really get to the final answers of what's more critical or not. But we do have some leads there. I think that's a great area to explore. Uh, because I think there's some really important, uh, you know, ideas in there that might be very useful to supplement brain tissue related to keeping cells, uh, I hate to call it, but younger, or older, whatever you want to term that. So, so we don't have a lot more detail, but it's in her thesis and in some of the other work. Thank you. Um, uh, this question is uh, about using silk-based bioscaffold in other applications. As you showed, silk is a promising biomaterial for tissue regeneration. However, I was wondering if it can be used as an edible protein-based bioscaffold. <laughs> uh, well, I'm, I'm somebody who's eaten silk scaffolds and I'm still here to talk to you today. So no problem there. There are a lot of uh, consumer materials on the market around the world. If those of you who travel, excuse me, to Japan, China, Elsewhere, you'll see uh, silk-based pastas. You'll see uh, treatments for, um, you know, your digestive tract with silk-based oral delivery system. So people eat silk all the time, no problem. People eat silk worms that have silk in them all the time. I've done that, and I'm still here again. So the answer is yes. You could make edible scaffolds, and they'd be perfectly safe. It's sort of a grass material also in FDA approved medical devices now, so it should be fine. Excellent. Well, that's all the questions I have, uh, Professor Kaplan. I appreciate your time. Thank yeah, you, everyone. David, thank you. Thank you very much, by the way. Um, I, I had another, um, I had a presentation myself, so I came a little bit late, but, uh, but wonderful to see you. And hopefully we'll do this again um, soon in person. I hope so too, Ali. Thanks so much for having me today. Great to talk to you guys. Be safe, thank everyone. You. Thank you. Bye-bye.